One shoulder pads were our armor, and hair was a tower. We ruled the world with a mixtape power. Now we're swiping through life hour by hour in a Gen Z maze of Gen X scour. Dodging TikToks and emoji showers, clinging to our vinyl and its magical powers. From disco balls to the smartphone towers, we're time travelers. Welcome back, Retro fans. Matt here with yet another episode of the Retro Rewind Experience. And today I have got something insanely cool. Today I'm interviewing a friend of the channel, an amazing musician, and some might say a guitar god. The Duke of Metal, the guardian of the jukebox, and he whose mojo is never stuck, Rich Ward. How's it going, my friend? I'm so Matt, psyched to finally get to talk to you. Yeah, Matt, it's my privilege. I've been following your channel for a million years. I was like one of the early comers of the channel and fans. I love your content. And as a kid who grew up in the 80s, uh, graduated high school in 87, uh, played in a million bands in high school, playing all the hits that were on the radio and being in love with all things 80s culture, I naturally gravitated towards your content. And it's an honor to speak with you. I'm an idiot 80s kid. And so I try and just talk about how much I love stuff. There's no politics, no religion. You know, there's no point in any of that. So it's just like, we all enjoyed this stuff, this music. You know, when we were growing up, that was our social media. You know, you would go to school and you would talk about what movies you just saw. You would talk about, oh, I finally saw Porky's or whatever. You know what I mean? And that's how you bond it. And that's how, that's how I, I kind of built the channel. It's like, it's just fun. It's stupid fun. <laughs> I love it because there's a reverence for the decade and the way that you talk about it in such romantic terms is really resonates with me. I mean, one of the big things to piggyback on what you just said, the big thing was the night after a concert or the day after a concert, everyone wore their concert t-shirts to school. It was like your, it was the equivalent of like, my ba I had a backstage pass. Like you showed everybody last night I went to see U2 or I went to see Ozzy Osbourne or like whatever band you win. It was like a big thing. And we all communed around that. And there wasn't as many clicks back then as there are now. Um, Back then, MTV dictated the culture of music in a lot of ways. And in the early and mid 80s, it was Madonna into Dokken, into Prince, into Lionel Richie, and it played everything. There was, there was no segregation of styles. It was all part of one big group. Um, and that was what was great is that if you watched MTV, and we all did, uh, you were exposed to everything. And, and it was this... 13 or 19 inch box into the world. It was this incredible opportunity to learn about British bands and German bands and Australian bands and that we'd never heard of because I grew up in a somewhat small town, Charlotte, North Carolina. So I didn't, I wasn't living in LA or New York or Chicago where there was a scene um, where, you know, there was this energy around music. Charlotte was a you know, a small Southern town. And we had record stores, of course, but I needed to know what records to buy. And I didn't have an older brother or sister. Um, occasionally I'd have a babysitter that would clue me in to go get the new REO Speedwagon record or something like that. Wait a minute, you did have an older sister. Her name was Martha Quinn. Yes, amen. She was, she, she guided all of us properly. But back in the eighties, there was such a diversity, like you said, I mean, it was crazy what would be in the top 10. I mean, it would be a mix of like 15 different styles and there's only 10 spots, you know, like you get like Prince or, or, or the police in there and you've got some extra styles going on, but. Yeah. And throw in Peter Gabriel and then throw in Van Halen. And it, like you said, it was the biggest mix. And the great thing was back then MTV, it was that era starting in 81 when MTV launched, it changed the way people dressed. That was the big thing because in the seventies, you know, coming in from the hippie culture into the hard rock acid culture of the mid and late seventies into disco, everyone was still wearing bell bottoms and like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, button down shirts with their chest hair uh, poking out. I mean, there was, I was, there was a uniformity. I still dress like that. Amen. Hey, uh, proud, <laughs> proud, proud to be born and uh, raised in the seventies as well. But you know, I mean, 
Madonna and Michael Jackson were establishing fashion trends. You, you know, you and we were all going to the mall to try. This is you know, obviously pre-internet, so we all had to go to the the shops to find what they were to get our Michael Jackson zipper jacket or your members only jacket. You know, or, or your your Cavarici, uh, you know, pants, and it was a big thing. And and I think for us too is that there, um, there wasn't as much tribalism, I'll say, you know, as there is now um, towards things, and which was great because you we could all eat lunch together and talk about all the same artists that we all loved. Um, you know, I mean, I was a metal kid too. So I, obviously I loved Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and Ozzy and Scorpions and those bands, but I also was listening to the radio. So I was getting Howard Jones and Berlin and I was getting Flock of Seagulls and Gary Newman. And we were all getting the, you know, the, the new wave and the new romantic influence from Europe as well, which was, and from New York city, which was brilliant. I mean, I, I could not be happier to be an 80s kid uh, because I we were lucky. And I know our parents would have said, well, you should have been there in the 50s. I was like, well, I'll take your word for it. But I, I'm just glad I was an 80s kid. Oh, yeah. And and I mean, going, you know, kind of building on what you said is even if you didn't, you know, even if you didn't have something specifically in common with somebody, you would always find something to bond with. And again, we're talking kids. We're not talking adults. Adults are fucked. You know what I mean? I mean, that's just the way you know, any generation. They're not pliable. Kids are pliable, right? We, we, we were constantly taking in new data and new information and we're open to new ideas. And that was what was great about being a kid. Yeah. And if, if like you were like, oh, I hate Jimmy. And then you're like, oh, wait, you know, he, you know, he went and saw Prince or he went and saw Bon Jovi. You're like, oh, I fucking liked him. And then you had something to connect with. You ignored the other stuff. And, you know, it just because it didn't matter because, you know, it's like you found something to connect with. And and I think that's what a lot of people miss. And again, is it romanticizing it? Probably, maybe, probably. But it's, uh, you know, it, it's we had these things to connect with. And now things are so fractured because there's so much content out there. You know, like we had a more limited selection, but it was it was more diverse in what was a hit. But I'm going to jump over. And so so let's 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 we, we talked a little bit of music. Let's let's jump over to, to movies. I want to I want to know more about you. I got to get inside rich. What what type of movies were in your wheelhouse as a kid? Give me your top five 80s movies. And we're not going to hold you to this, maybe, you know, but just give give us your top five. Like what makes you happy? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm a Indiana Jones, Star Wars adventure. I love those. I mean, it, obviously, that was that was the thing coming out of the late 70s into the early 80s was these big action adventure films. And they really were a big part of my childhood. So, you know, definitely Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, um, all three Indiana Jones movies. And then, you know, Back to the Future changed my life. Rocky Four, the greatest of all 80 sports films. Um, you know, it's it would be hard for me to kind of limit it down, but I loved E.T. And then, then I was a horror guy too. So, I mean, I loved the, all of the Halloween and the, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street and the Friday the 13th, that was a big thing. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if you've talked about it before with your channel, but the one great thing about 80s movie culture was the culture of midnight movies. And there was something that was so special to us. And it was where we all came together and we got permission from our parents and we had to make sure we went with a group of friends. But it was a big thing at all the big theaters. And most of the theaters when you and I were growing up, the maximum was around four screens. But most of them were kind of in that two to four screens. And at least two of those screens would be dedicated at midnight to Rocky Horror Picture Show or The Song Remains the Same or Pink Floyd The Wall or um, any number of, you know, Dawn of the Dead. So they were kind of these niche, fun films that we all came together to watch these, what we considered at the time classic films, but they were only a few years old. Um, and it was incredible culture, the midnight movie thing. And, you know... If you saw a movie on TV back then, it was kind of a special thing. You know, they'd always go, special feature movie presentation of this. If you were going to see a movie, you either had to have HBO or you were going to the theaters. For, for, in most cases, um, you know, I mean, we could talk about the advent of VHS tapes and stuff, but we still it really valued the movie theater experience. 
Yeah, it's that it goes back to that social thing. We were a lot more kind of social, like face to face social, not social media social. But it, it's like you liked going there, and it was the there's there's energy, and you get this from performing. And um, I mean, and I was going to talk about this later, but I'll jump around. I always tell people because I, you know, I performed as a comedian. I used to do appearances when I worked in film and television. I was in the world's largest in excess cover band. Um, but there's there's something about being on stage and that energy you know, of the crowd. You know why rock stars get hooked on drugs? It's because they're on the ultimate drug when they're on stage. And there's nothing, there's seriously nothing like that feeling. You know what I mean? It's like, you can say something, you know, like as a comedian, you can say something and you can control the crowd. You can get them angry. You can flip it and make them laugh. And and that feeling is just so fucking amazing. But that 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 permeates into the crowd, that crowd experience, like going there and being with, you know, 500, you know, people that are there to see the same thing that you love. Like that energy is, is amazing. And I think it's lost a little bit now. I mean, concerts are still around, but like we used to do it with, with movies and, and movies were the same thing. You know, I remember uh, like the, the reaction when back to the future, when the end of back to the future hit and it said to be continued, like that crowd reaction was like, Yes, <gasps> yes the cheering. Yeah, exactly right. And we also, mall culture was a big thing. The arcades, the skateboard parks. We were more communal creatures back then. And I remember going to the mall on a Saturday. We had an ice skating rink at the mall and there was this ice cream shop that we all used to go to. There was an arcade and we would spend four or five hours at the mall, all of us. And you wouldn't just be with your friends because all of the other people from your school and other schools would also be at the same mall. And it was this incredible communal thing. And even for us before we were 16, it was how we learned how to establish pecking orders and how we learned how to work in group environments and stuff. And, you know, I mean, we were also grew up in that era where our parents tried to put us in everything, you know, it was Boy Scouts and baseball and soccer and, you know, martial arts. And we all had to be involved in everything. There was kind of this sense of um, the world is this big, exciting place for you to try lots of different flavors. And um, nowadays, you know, I mean, you try those flavors through your phone or through your, you know, your tablet or something, and it's just not the same. You're simulating the experience. I mean, being on a sat in a Saturday afternoon and hearing Blondie and the cars on the PA in the at the skateboard park, and everyone's riding together, and this just big family. And, and I I miss those days, and I really reminisce about them a lot because it is different. I know my dad does the same thing to me when he reminisces about coming up, and we're all protective of our childhood and we all at least those of us who uh, you know found the good in it not everyone had you know uh lucky charms for breakfast <laughs> although if you didn't i'm so sorry yeah well and you know the other thing that we had is i i think it was kind of one of the and the millennials as well uh, there was a sense of personal uh responsibility so like if you were out there and you said something stupid you had to back it up one way or the other <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. it's like you know, or if, if you were out with your friends and you were going to do something wrong, you knew there was a good chance your parents were going to find out and you made that choice. You're like, you know what, let's take the chance. But you were ready to take the consequences. Yes. And again, not everybody, but most of us, that's how we grew up. You know, there was that personal responsibility. It's like, OK, I'm going to do something stupid. But if I get caught or I get in trouble, it's my fault. You yeah. Know? And then I'll do the next stupid thing next week. But even our parents made us accountable for that. There wasn't a, well, I'm going to go call Jimmy's dad and yell at him for punching you in the nose. You know, our dads would say, what did you do to Jimmy? Why did he punch you in the nose? <laughs> yeah. Or if you go out and you're like, uh, you know, you did something and the other parent hit you. Some random parent was like, ah, don't be an idiot. And then you go home and you tell your mom, hey, you know, Jimmy's mom hit me. And they're like, well, what did you do? It's not like, well, fuck, they hit you. No, it's like, well, what did you do? Because you did something or they weren't going to hit you. There was some communal community. Uh, yeah, I, I hate the I hate the phrase. It takes a village, but really, our neighborhoods were kind of a small little village. We knew all our neighbors, and the kids played together and rode bikes together and played kickball in the park together. And then and the neighbors' parents all knew each other. And you're right, your neighborhood holds you responsible if he saw you messing around. It, and and if he didn't feel comfortable yanking a knot in you, he'd call your parents. You know, there yeah. was some, and that was. That was cool. And it wasn't like you could email or text. It was like the rotary phone. I'm calling your mother, <laughs> you little jerk. Well, yeah. And if you got that call, you know, you were as a kid, you were dreading it. It's like, oh, yes. I know what that phone calls about. <laughs>
Okay, so I'm gonna, you know what? Let's let's talk a little bit about your music. So, um, how did it start for you? Where, why are you the Duke? Let's start there. Is it because Prince was already taken? Oh God, I wish. Uh, well, you know, so I played music in high school because I was such a music fan. I loved albums. I still have a turntable five feet right over there, and I was listening to Missing Persons' first record this morning when I was doing my little morning stretches. Um, DDP I, yoga. 100%. Um, and um, I always wanted to be in a band because my heroes were in bands. I never had the idea that I was going to be in a famous band because I that's like the equivalent of saying, hey, I'm going to be the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. It's like there's one, you know, like this, it's a rarefied air. You, you're you not even thinking in terms of that. You're just thinking of girls will think I'm cool. You know, my friends will think I'm awesome if I can learn how to play this Def Leppard song on guitar. And so it started there. And, um, you know, I tried a few other things. Like I, I went to junior college because my parents said, you've got to do this. Uh, I lasted six weeks. I just didn't want, I mean, I just wanted to be in it. And I was in a band at the time, like all young musicians, you get together with other musicians and you play and maybe you do a pool party or maybe you're lucky enough to play a high school dance uh, after a basketball game and stuff. And it kind of started like that. And I had a job waiting tables and I met this uh, bass player who looked like he was, should be in a reggae band. And it was the first black musician that I had ever met that wasn't listening to the same hard rock records that I was. And he was telling me about this funk rock thing that he was putting together. And I was telling him, oh, I'm a rock guitar player. This sounds cool. And after kind of his infectious energy talking about it, um, and this was kind of 1989. So this was kind of when the hair metal thing had kind of run its course a bit, you know, like things were changing, you know, Bobby Brown and Janet Jackson were the big names. And there was this new wave of music. You had Faith No More and the Chili Peppers coming out of the, right there at the tip of the late eighties and things were starting to change. And I was excited by that change. I liked this experimental fusion of different styles of music. And we started a band which became Stuck Mojo and, and we got signed and, did very well. And part of it was just because we were at the front end of the wave. We were one of the first kind of rap rock funk bands to come out of that era. Um, we did really well in 1996, we were voted MTV's best live band in Europe and we had MTV music videos and stuff, but that was right at the end of MTV's wave of like about their, in, their impact on the culture. So, um, and that band was great. And you were talking about the live experience and that band was a very aggressive, heavy rhythm band. So that energy was incredible because it was, it, it made you feel full of power. It's that same kind of energy. If you saw Metallica or White Zombie or something like that, that kind of, and God, like you said, it's, you, you can't even describe the feeling of thousands of people moshing and stage diving and, to someone who hasn't done it and it's it's incredible and that band um just stopped getting along like happens with a lot of bands we'd been together for over 10 years and we had a couple lineup changes and the magic wasn't quite there anymore and i met professional wrestler chris jericho at backstage at a wcw wrestling event uh, i met him because stuck mojo did a hybrid wrestling rock video in 1998 that WCW premiered on their Monday Nitro show. So then I kind of became endeared by the wrestling community as the rock guitar player from the rap rock band. Um, you know, and then I met Chris and he told me that he used to sing and play bass when he was in high school and he always wanted to put a band together. And just as Stuck Mojo was like, kind of, I was losing that love and feeling. I met Chris and we started a band called Fozzie. And that band started kind of like um, Spinal Tap or the Blues Brothers or what people I would love kind the of fake say. back. The backstory was so much fun. It was. It was fun because that was the idea. Is like I'd been in this super heavy, serious um, metal band, and then I got a chance to be in a band with a professional wrestler who was one of the greatest entertainers and frontmen in the world, and 
he wanted to do this fun thing, which kind of, for those who may know who Steel Panther is, it predated that, but it was a similar thing. Fake names, we went out, we played lots of cover songs, we made... You mean songs that you guys actually wrote back in the 80s? Correct. We pretended like we wrote them. And we actually did a 30-minute documentary, a fake documentary that they played on MTV that was basically saying, hey, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, Iron Maiden, they stole all these songs from us. We, we're not recording their songs. These are songs we wrote first, and they got a hold of our demos. It was a really fun thing we did. And that lasted about three years, and Chris approached me and said, how many years do you want to keep telling this funny joke? Or should we just make some original records and take this more seriously? And we did. So then we had Fozzie version two, and uh, and that's been going for 25 years. And we've had lots of top 10 hits, and we've opened for Iron Maiden and Metallica and uh, Motorhead and all the, the some of the greatest bands in the world. And uh, headlined Wembley Stadium and done incredible things. And it's been, it's it's very difficult to to have success in the music business. And the fact that I've been part of two successful bands back to back is almost, you know, it's it's one of those the pinch you kind of things. And I don't take all the credit for it. A lot of it was I was there at a time where the doors were opening and I just ran really fast through them and worked really hard and was willing to, when other musicians said, why, why would you keep doing this? There's no money. It was like, why well, didn't start doing this for money? If, yeah, if you were thinking All there was girls, money, to, duh. <laughs> 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 like, what is like, like, like people who climb Everest, you're not, you're not making any money. It's like, no, this costs me a hundred thousand bucks to climb Everest. Do you want to go to the summit or don't you? This is, this life and it's exciting. And yeah, I make a living playing music now, but it wasn't the first thing on the agenda. The first thing, the agenda is to be the best pool party band in Charlotte, North Carolina was I was in 10th grade, you know, and it was a succession of those things. And, um, you know, and, and I've, and I've always put the music first. I'm a writer, producer of my bands that I've been in. Um, I found partners in those bands that that complete me, uh, Jerry Maguire style. Um, you know, Jericho completes me. He is the, the quintessential David Lee Roth or Axl Rose or Paul Stanley. And I'm his really good Ace Freely or Slash. I'm his good number two. And being a number two guy is fantastic. Because it has a whole different list of r rules and roles and duties to do. And a lot of that is the fundamentals that I love, which is writing and recording and producing and letting the star go out there and be the star and stand up there and be the king of the world. There's nothing wrong with being Randy Rhodes standing next to Ozzy Osbourne. You know, that's a great gig if you can get it. Um, but yeah, and I've just been lucky to be really good, important number twos in two, no two different bands. Well, and that's, I mean, that's kind of something I wanted to talk about too, is, um, you know, when you, when you mention Fozzy, you'll get the people that have kind of heard it and they're like, oh yeah, that's that wrestler band. I'm like, well, have you, have you listened to it? Have you seen Chris Jericho perform in whatever he does? Like he's, he's not just a, he's an entertainer and he takes that, like everything I've ever seen him do. I mean, he's a smart motherfucker. Like he's smart. Yeah. And he's the yes. fastest, like one of the fastest people I've, I've ever seen on a microphone. Like if you throw something yes. out at him, he's got stuff in his head and he's a star. And, and especially when he's backed by something like your abilities and your guitar, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know? Um, but let's, let's, let's talk about it. What is your definition of a star? Like a rock star? What is a rock star? You know, what makes someone a rock star on stage? Well, it's not just trashing hotel rooms. No, no, it, you know, and I think that's I think that's played up because there's been some fantastic, you know, um, single events that are are legendary that have kind of created that facade. But I think it's when the person walks actually in I'm room. interrupting you. Yeah, yeah. But I got arrested in Germany because of what my dad did with Bill Haley in the comments. I got to hear the story. My dad was the lead guitar player for Bill Haley in the comments. And so wow. his job was, was Bill Haley was a, he was an alcoholic. And so if Bill got crazy somewhere, my dad got twice as crazy. So people didn't notice Bill. <laughs> Best wingman ever. 
Yeah. In about 65, they were given the key to Berlin. And people don't want to hear this story. They want to hear about you, but fuck it. No, they do want to hear it. I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So they got drunk. They were trashing places. They have the key to the city. They decide, they hear that a Volkswagen bug can float. So they steal one and they drive it into a pool and quickly find that it doesn't. And they get arrested. And this is like, you can find this on the internet. This is something you can go and find. And Bill goes to jail with the key to Berlin. You know, and there's like a picture of him holding it up as he's getting taken away. Fast forward about 30 years later, and I'm working in Berlin on a TV show called The Highlander. And we're filming there and I'm in the same spot and we're drinking. And I decide, well, my dad did it. So I should probably do the same thing. Oh, and amazing. We, we grabbed a car, drove it into a pool. I get arrested and I call my dad and I'm not getting bailed out. I call him and I tell him what happened. And he's like, Fucking A. And then he hangs up on me. <laughs> You're on your own, son. But yeah, it's like, well, you did it. So yeah, good good job there. <laughs> that's incredible, man. What a great story. But no, that 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 the, that's not what a rock star is. But like, what is your definition of what's a what's a star? What is a rock star? What's the it factor? Like Jericho has it, you have it. Like I've seen you on stage and the energy that you throw out there, like you look like you're having fun. I mean, like genuinely like, oh, that dude's he's he doesn't even know there's people here. I mean, you do. But you know what I mean? It's yeah, like it's he's crazy. just up there. He's just up there killing it because that's what he does. Yeah, I think I think part of that um, comes down to someone who is a self-realized person. There's you're not performing. You know, this is really who you are because people are attracted to people who know who they are and um, who are not cosplaying this stuff. You and I have been to a million shows where you see someone from a band and you know they're performing this really isn't who they are um it doesn't mean that it can't be an extension like it was i don't believe that ozzy osbourne was that way off stage but it, it definitely was an extension of his personality and i think it's people who you can't look away from you know um for better or worse they're kind of uh, somewhere between the most beautiful magnanimous person and a car wreck you know that thing that just has a magnetic pull uh, pull to it, something that has its own gravitational field. And um, and I think that's something, it's hard to say because I've tried this actually when I, um, when I first tried putting together a few bands when I was younger with really talented musicians, you realize that talent is just the price of admission. It's not gonna get you anywhere. There's millions of talented people who will never do anything in the music business. It really has to do with building relationships with an audience. And building a relationship with an audience comes from them seeing you and feeling like they are being pulled through a tractor beam into something that makes them feel away, you know? heightening all the senses and that's why bono you know you can say whatever you want he's a great singer he's not a great singer what that's not a debate that i would even have the thing is is that when he speaks everyone listens and he has a way an 80s quote ef hutton you know and it's like when he talks man people listen and he has a way about him that's genuine and you just feel like you're in the presence of something special um and you know there are a lot of bands out there who have super talented members who will never draw a crowd and except for maybe other musicians who are wowed by their prowess. But I think the average person, that's why we love Tom Cruise. I don't think Tom Cruise is ever going to be accused of being the greatest actor of all time, but his movies make you feel and they, they have a heart to it. There's something about this movies that you just feel something from Tom. There's something special about the way that he is. And I, you know, I, w I want to see every Tom Cruise movie there is because I know there's going to be something special about it. And I think that's why people love, you know, I think that's why people still are rooting for people like Bon Jovi, who's struggling vocally right now because he's aging. But they're rooting for him because, you know, he's he was special to the culture for a couple of decades and. He was an important part. And I really feel like John was a working class rock star. You know, he was the next generation of Bruce Springsteen, you know, who, and I love that. He found his thing and he found his audience because they loved who he was and he identified with who they are. And that's the whole, you know, and then 
the bigger your appeal is, the bigger your audience audience will. You know, Glenn Danzig, as cool as he is, is going to have a narrower audience because it's kind of a niche thing. Um, whereas Bon Jovi's tent was big, and we were all there, you know, with a red solo cup of tap. I love Bon Jovi because uh, when I was 13, they, I grew up in Hawaii. They came to Hawaii when I was 13, and that was the first time I ever saw boobs in the wild. My, my dad let me go to the concert by myself. Like, seriously, I would kiss Bon Jovi on the mouth for this, just so everybody knows. But I saw boobs in the wild, and it was amazing. You know, I looked around, and I'm in, like, the third row right in the front, and I turn, and there's breasts there. And I'm like, this is the best yeah. thing ever. Yeah. The exposing of the breast was a thing. I, I, I don't really – I still quite don't understand it, but it was a thing. You know, it was like T-tops or, you know, um, I don't know, neon, uh, you know, v visors. Like, it was a thing of the era. I'm, I don't it think was. in the 90s. I think once Nirvana, it was the, the exposing of breast era was over. I mean, I'm not saying we're a lot more depressed. <laughs> they may have come out accidentally, but it was intentional in the 80s. Yeah, it was. I, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna kiss your butt a little bit now. So I loved I love snapping necks, oh, and awesome. being honest, I I stole something because of of Stuck Mojo. I was good. good. I was I was at a we were filming a movie in New York, and we went to a party afterwards. And I was at this this chick's house, and they were I had never heard you guys before, and and this was Pig Walk. Uh, she was playing pig walk, the, you know, um, uh, uh, here comes the monster, and, uh, you know, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it was awesome. And it's like, oh, this is super cool. I didn't know who it was. You know, this was 96 ish, 97, yeah. somewhere around yeah. there. And, um, and so the next day, you know, I'm, I'm doing the sneak out and I grab my jacket and there's like the CD there. And I'm like, <laughs> I never fucking snagged the CD and left. And so, yeah, I, I stole, I totally stole that poor girl's uh, pig walk CD, but. <laughs> yeah, good. You, you, well, that's good. Cause I, I sold another copy. I still have it. She bought, the, she bought the other one. Oh, nice. She bought, you sold two. <laughs> <laughs> she had to go get another one. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say that band was, it was a, it was a cool thing for me too, because we, we resonated with a, an interesting audience, um, because a lot of the metalheads were digging us, but we were also being booked, especially in Europe, with a lot of the kind of Northeast hardcore bands, um, because that kind of crossover rap rock thing was really kind of existing in the same universe as those Northeastern hardcore metal bands. And then the new metal thing started happening in 96, 97, 98, it became a big thing. And then we were part of then that that scene as well, part of like Corn and um, Rob Zombie's thing. And, you know, and, and that was a cool scene too. Um, but all those scenes had shelf lives. And it was, it was fun for me that I got out of Stuck Mojo at a time. I mean, we still made records later on. I did a lot of reunion records because it's my first love. I'll always want to be a part of that band because there's something magic in, in that, that, that that band that I want to keep alive, but we got out of it right as it was becoming overpopulated. It was almost the same thing that was happening kind of in in metal when I started Stuck Mojo. It was like it was towards the end. It it, it had reached. It was that milk that had a couple of days left of it. You better get put it in your coffee first, quick, because it's need to go in the garbage. And I've just been real fortunate that. To, to find those four guys in Atlanta, Georgia, to do a rap rock thing with a with a funk reggae bass player, and the drummer was a jazz rock guy. It was just it was four people that didn't belong together, but somehow the pieces were so complementary, and we all spoke enough of each other's language that we could create something special together. That it wasn't so fractured that we felt like it didn't work. So it was, yeah, it was, and it was special time because everyone was looking for new things. You know, it was that the nineties was this moment of, you know, where it was applauded if you tried something different. The eighties were the era of there's some rules here because there were some gatekeepers. There were four or five really big record companies and everything filtered through them. You had some independent labels, but everything was really was really dictated by the four or five big labels and MTV. So there was some gatekeeping, for better or worse, 
So there were some rules about what it took to get on the charts, even though things were there was plenty of diversity. But they still the bumper the there were still bumpers up on the bowling alley. You weren't going to cross the ball over into the other lane. And the '90s, it was like, what you got? Let's try something completely different. And that was really cool. Music was kind of fractured, you know, like that that transition from from the the '80s into grunge, and then kind of the mess that grunge left. And I, I don't mean that in a bad way. But no, it, it kind of right. overturned so much stuff. You're right. But then you had this weird carryover. And I don't know how much you're into this, but you have this weird carryover of the sound of bands like Expose, which would have led into like, you know, Destiny's Child. And you have like this very specific, like, like big voice, like dance Miami sound that that somehow survived and became big. And yeah. Um, I but love yeah, that the stuff. 90s music was just weird. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. And, uh, but, but yeah, you guys, you guys stood out and it was a great sound and it was something that was different. And, um, but I, I might have another question because my, my co-host back here, Prince, Michael Jackson or Prince. So like, that's the, that's the important question. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to preface it here because, you know, with Prince, you had somebody that was a prodigy, you know, you had somebody that played every instrument. He may have invented extra instruments just to play on his albums. <laughs> he produced it. He did everything. On the Michael Jackson side, you've got you've got this this talent that crossed, you know, like even racial barriers. Like when he was a kid, he was a young, poor black kid and he grew up to be a rich white woman. So like which one is better? Um, I, I, it's like I wrote that like especially that, for you, just so you know, that was, it was, it was fantastic. Um, I have to say that it, it get, like if you're saying because to me, the true test is if you're on a on, if you're in the car and you're on a drive which one am I putting in the, you know, what I'm putting on the stereo and it's always MJ. I mean, I will always say that Prince had, I don't know what talent means because it's subjective, but obviously if, if, if America's got talent, Prince is going to come up and mop the floor with just being able to show diversity of range. And like you said, that the production and everything, and it was incredible. And he was just as influential on the culture in a lot of ways as MJ was, but I liked MJ's music more. I, I off the wall and thriller to this day, I listen to those records all the time and they make me happy. And there's something about Billy those Jean. albums. Oh, I could, I mean, off the wall, especially because that was that record came out when I was ten or eleven, and I think, and I think it did, was that nineteen eighty or is it seventy nine? It was, yeah, it was right. It was somewhere in there, uh, seventy nine, eighty. I don't remember exactly, but it's right. It was there. like the perfect crossover of like where um, because music was a little segregated between the races back then. You know, Motown and that and that stack sound was considered in the industry as black music. Um, and R and B in the seventies was mainly considered black music, even though white people loved it, but it, the industry somehow had to segregate it into two worlds. Um, but MJ with off the wall was the first time that an R and B record with some R and B production with the big horns and Quincy Jones is brilliance at the helm was able to usher what was considered previously more of a black sound to a white audience, but everyone loved it. And I think that's what I love the most about MJ was that he was the real bridge for all of us where we didn't have to call it black music anymore, or we didn't have to call it white music. It was music. And although I think Prince did that a lot as well, I think Michael Jackson was the most successful person um, to erase color barriers, not only musically, but in <laughs> His own complexion. See, it's my joke. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think exactly. Like, I think people didn't care. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. they realized, like, it it doesn't matter. I mean, if it's good music, fuck, like, who who cares about any of that stuff? Like, really? Yeah. Well, it was when R and B R and B perfectly married pop music. It was just the moment. It had been done. And he's before, the first. The course. first black star played on on MTV. I did not so, know that. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and and rightfully so, right? I mean, he was the king of pop. He he owned it. I I was lucky enough to see him on the Dangerous tour. Um, I I wish I had seen him before then. It was still fantastic, but I didn't. You know, I I was going through my I'm a metal kid phase, and all my money was spent on Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, you know, Scorpions, every one of those bands. Uh, 
And then, you know, towards the late end of the late 80s is when I really started. Matter of fact, there's a band from New York called Dan Reed Network that was a very influential band for me. I listened to them. They were kind of came out in the expose era, kind of this interesting dance music, but played really well. And um, I really liked that. I mean, Information Society was another one of those bands that was bridging late 80s into 90s dance. And I, I really liked that stuff. I was, you know, I and everybody else did, too. I mean, they sold lots of records. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, Obviously, you're a huge 80s fan. How did Guardians of the Jukebox come about? I mean, I know you're you're touring with Fozzy, but you're also, right now, you guys are actively moving around uh, on Guardians of the Jukebox. Yeah, Guardians of the Jukebox is actually my, my primary band right now. Um, and it's for several reasons. One is that, you know, my Fozzy frontman, Chris Jericho, has 10 jobs, and they're all, like, A-lister jobs. He films lots of movies. He has his own movie production company that he does releases independent films with. He's a four times New York times bestseller author. He's got podcast and he's wrestles every Wednesday night on TV for AEW. He's got lots of stuff. So we went from playing about 120 shows a year with Fozzie to now around 50 or 60. Well, just so you know, I'm here, I'm ready to tag in at any point. Just throwing that out <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, and the beautiful thing about it is, is it's another one of these things where the universe has provided at the very moment that when something else was kind of retracting a little bit, not because there's not energy in the Fozzie camp, just because of scheduling. And then all of a sudden, this band that I uh, put together in the pandemic era, because nobody was touring, everything was shut down. Um, and I had, uh, I had always been toying around with the idea of having a tribute band of some type. Um, I didn't know if it was going to be all 80s or it was just going to be my favorite songs to play locally because we were thinking this could last for a while. At first, all of us thought, well, this is a two-week thing. Two weeks to stop, spread the curve. Then it's four and six weeks. And, and I don't like sitting around. So I said, okay, this is the opportunity to do this thing. And I didn't have a necessary one idea of what it should be like. I had the name Guardians of the Jukebox and I had my band members from Fozzy that I was going to start it with. Um, and I had some other local musicians and the idea was just playing my favorite songs and playing them at some local watering holes like cover bands do. I played a couple of shows and it was like the worst addiction I've ever had in my life because I've never had that kind of reaction at a show myself. I was like feeling things that I had never felt playing for Fozzy or Stuck Mojo. It was this almost religious experience of playing the songs that I grew up with, that I was hallowed ground and playing them with reverence, not playing our version, playing their version. We don't do Lionel Richie songs the way that somebody who's doing a re-record like um, Chris Cornell did Billie Jean. No, no, no. If we're going to play Billie Jean, Michael Jackson had it right the first time. We play it the way you remember it. Now, I'm a rock guitar player, and I have my own thumbprint of how I play, so that much I can't change. I'm not going to be able to play like the guitar player who played a Lionel's records, who was Steve Lukather from Toto. I don't play like him. I play like me. So when you hear it, it's going to be my interpretation of how those songs were written, meaning my thumbprint is different. Our singers, we have two fantastic primary singers, Searsha and Doug Busby, and Searsha handles, obviously, all of our female vocal stuff. And Doug handles the majority of our male stuff. I sing a couple of songs. Um, and the idea is to embrace, find that place where we intersect with them. Where do I intersect with Toto? I'm never going to be able to sing like the guys in Toto. But I'm taking, I'm meeting them halfway. I'm taking what I do as a singer, because I sing the verse part in Africa, which Steve Lukather sings on the record. And Steve and I sing differently. Wait, you're Pitbull? I, God, I wish. <laughs> God, then I could do anything I want. I could literally drive a, I could drive the most expensive Lamborghini into a pool in Germany and not worry about it. But, and I just fell in love with this band. And then I, we had some lineup changes because it started as one idea, which is for fun, play these songs. And then I said, 
no, 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 no. This is not going to be for fun anymore. This is going to be my passion project that I'm going to grow old with. And I'm going to do everything the same way I did with Stuck Mojo and the same way I did with Fozzie. I'm going to treat this with the utmost respect and reverence, just like I would have if this was my band that I started with my best friends. And I put together an incredible band full of people who are true believers who think the 80s was the greatest thing that ever happened and also don't want to, they don't want to stand up there and say, I'm better than um, uh, Annie Lennox. Because we ain't going to be better than Annie Lennox. We're going to bend the knee to Annie Lennox and show reverence to the Eurythmics when we play Sweet Dreams. And we meet them in in the church of the 80s and we we connect with an audience because it's not your uncle's tribute band. We don't, this is not our weekend golf game. We're going to the, the summit of Everest. Most tribute bands go to base camp one and boil water with the Sherpas because that's all they want to do. They want to have fun. This is great. We have some drinks and we're going to do this. It's like, no, no. I, I want to go to the Super Bowl with this band. And, and, and because there's no point in putting it on the pads and even starting to scrimmage if you don't want to go to the Super Bowl. And that's always been my mentality. So I want to be the best band that anyone's ever seen doing these songs. And I think we are. I really do. And, and it's, we haven't, every show hasn't been a home run because we, sometimes we'll pick a song that we say, God, we got to do this one. We have to do this song. And then we play it and we go, yeah, that song was great, but not when we played it. This is not suited for us. Like, you have to be humble enough to know what, where you are great and what are songs that you feel natural. Like I talked about earlier, what's a rock star? No cosplay. Not go up there and play the song because you like it. Because that song may not like you. You may not be good at it. You find the songs that feel like you could have written and recorded them. You find those songs, and then when you play them, you're not cosplaying anymore. They become the audience's song and the band's song, and we're celebrating this jam together in the Church of the 80s. And I always tell people, we don't do concerts. We do group therapy sessions. Like, bring your baggage. Bring, bring your woes. You know, bring your, I had a rough week. My grandma's sick. Bring that stuff. We're going to shed all of it and we're going to sing and dance together. And that's what the Guardians of the Jukebox do. We don't, I don't stand up there and ch check out my guitar playing. I've been doing that for 35 years. I, I don't, I don't need to be recognized as a guitar shred guy. I don't need to, I want to play these songs and make people feel something. That's the magic. And I didn't think that when I started the band, this was something I found out about in the band. Like I had this epiphany as I'm doing it. I'm on stage playing. I want to know what love is. And I'm seeing a mid 30 something year old African American lady crying. And I'm like, Oh, well, so this is doing the same thing to her. It's doing to me. Cause I'm crying too. When we play forever young by Rod Stewart, I'm bawling. Like I'm, these songs mean something and they should be religious moments for everybody. And when you play maniac, Michael Cimbello, everybody should be dancing and singing, going crazy. It's like we're meeting these moments where they're meant to be. And Michael Cimbello, Maniac, is a hard rock song. He just didn't know it was until I decided to add some little extra. You know, I never say I, I make it more aggressive. I just kick it a little bit. I give it a little bit more weight. You know what I mean? I, I and And I think that's our secret is, is that... I'm a rock guitar player and I get to add m my creative and elements to where they are. And we all do that as a band with reverence, knowing that these are not our songs to take liberties with. And if we do do it, knowing that somebody in the audience may go, God, I liked it a lot better when I heard whoever the artist, Huey Lewis do it. Be careful. These songs mean something to people. So respect the respect their memory. It's the same way with Dracar and Obsession. I remember what it smells like. I'm still buying 80s cars. I just bought an 80s car on Monday because I'm obsessed with the 80s. And I, you know, I got in the car and I was smelling just like that old leather seats and thinking, God, this is like, I, I'm a fan. I'm taking somebody put a new stereo in it. I'm taking it out and finding the original cassette deck stereo to put in it because I have a huge collection of cassettes so that I can play cassettes when I'm in it. Like, 
Like, I want to live that. I know it's silly. And I, some people give me grief about it. It's like, fine. If you want to just live on Twitter and be miserable reading about the, the, uh, the goings on in the world, you have at it. When I'm not working and when I'm not whatever living my life, my recreational time will be living at 9.8 out of 10 on peak happiness stuff. And that's, and I think that's what's been great about Guardians is that it's my job too. Like two weeks ago, we played in front of 10,000 people in Woodstock, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. Um, Night Ranger played the month before this big outdoor festival and we outdrew them by 3,000 people. And like people are like, how does how does Rich Ward's tribute band Guardians of the Jukebox draw a bigger crowd than Night Ranger? Well, we shouldn't. Night Ranger is one of my favorite bands. I saw them in 1988 at the Fox Theater in Atlanta with the outfield as the opener. Like, but we're doing something that's affecting people in a way. And I I I don't know if we're just conduits to the greats that came before us, and they're just hey, people need this. I'm happy if that's what, if, if I'm a conduit or if I'm actually the David Blaine doing the tricks, I don't know. All I know is the band is special and I'm honored to be in the band with the people I'm in. You can see the love, like when you play is, is I always tell people, cause they're like, oh, it's a, it's like a cover band. I'm like, uh, no, I was like, it's, it's like one of the best arena rock bands I've ever seen. And they just happen to be playing music that, you know. You know, what I mean, I mean, that's really all it is. It's it's like it's a it's a different level, you know, because, you know, here in Vegas, we go out and we see tons of cover bands and it's like, you know, they're good, but it's not this. It's not the same. You know what I mean? They're trying to be something that they're not. You guys are are I know like you, you said it was like a church thing, but that's kind of what it is. It's like you're you're like, here's this amazing thing we're going to share with you. And, you know, like we all love it. And that that love comes through. And like I said, when I watch you guys perform, it looks like you're having fun. And that's the most important thing. It's like, I get that energy. You know what I mean? It, it, that's, I think that's why you, you pull such big crowds and that's why people love the, the performances is because there's that positive energy that people connect with and they miss. And it's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. I just, yeah. it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely amazing. Um, so where can people see you play? I know that you guys are out right now all over the, the East Coast and then you're going to be in the UK. Yep. So um, I will also list in the, the show notes, you know, uh, all your links and, and links to your, your, your tour and stuff, but is awesome. there anything Thank coming you. up that you want to, that you want to pimp out? Are you, when are you coming to Vegas? Well, we're going to, so we've been, we've been, you know, we came out We're obviously uh, we came out and played the whiskey. Um, and I, that was a real priority for me is to get out there to California to, to play a couple. And I haven't, we haven't done New York yet, but I basically wanted to do a couple of, road trips with the band into some venues that I've played before with Stuck Mojo and Fozzie where I already had intact relationships where I knew I could get some shows because the band needs to, the band needs to travel some. Now we, we would play Florida, we play South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and we, but like it's mainly around the Southeast. Part of that reason is just because I, I still keep saying to people that we're in this beta testing um, era of Guardians of the Jukebox where we're still- I heard it was your parole, parole officer kept you that close <laughs> that's, that that's true is? yeah i have to check in on mondays um but but we did book a tour of the uk um which we're going over and we got a london show uh, we're playing a, a tribute band festival in nottingham and then we're to have a headlining show in manchester um and the purpose of that is when you travel as with a band as you know because you've done this traveling is the best bonding and growth um, opportunities that you can provide for your band. War together is what you want. One hundred percent. You you learn to come overcome ad, ad, adversarial, all the stuff we know. Like the airport, traveling with gear. You know, I mean, going. It's, there's a million things that can go wrong, and you need to experience those things as a band. I, I always tell people that School of Rock shouldn't be learn how to play. Uh, Motley Crue songs. School of Rock should be let Rich Ward come and tell you the pitfalls to avoid. Let me tell you about how to talk to a monitor guy so that your monitors sound better so that you can have a better show. Let me tell you how to be respectful to the venue and clean up your dressing room so that they don't end up saying, those guys were a pretty good band, but I'll never have them back because they trashed our dressing rooms like a bunch of jerks. 
there are some things in this business that that we need to do with Guardians of the Jukebox as a band to grow. It's the same thing that I did with the other two bands. So we will come to Vegas. We'll, we will come back to, to Los Angeles. We will do LA, um, excuse me, uh, New York, and play some other gigs. Right now, it's the summer season for us, and it's that season of all of these big summer concerts in the parks. Um, and we're playing almost every weekend in those. In the ones that we're not, we're doing club venues because I want to play every weekend. I don't, I don't like taking any time off. Uh, but the one thing about tribute bands, which is interesting, until you get as big as Brit, Pink Floyd, the big touring bands that play, you know, five nights a week and are in a bus, it's weekend work. No one's going to go see a tribute band on Tuesday night. It's, it's just the culture. It's not, there's not the infrastructure for it. The promoters don't want to take a risk on it. Um, so we're finding ourselves basically playing Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. And so we play every weekend and we're new songs, trying new things, what works, new, new video packages, because we do a huge multimedia video presentation as well that basically just features movies and TV commercials and all things 80s. Um, you know, there are shows a love letter to the 80s. Um, and the great thing about um, our song selections is we don't just pick songs that were popular in the eighties. We also look at Spotify play numbers because there were a lot of songs that were popular that just had an expiration date. It's very strange. Like you'll play them and people don't really recognize them, but you look at Spotify numbers and a lot of the ones that, you know, I mean, there's so many songs that I even thought, God, people are going to go nuts when you play this and people kind of don't recognize it for, a, you know, like Stand Back by Stevie Nicks. We played it and it's such a great song. I mean, I love that song. And our singer, Saoirse, our singer, crushes Stevie Nicks. But I noticed that about half the audience doesn't quite even know the song until you get to the chorus. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know the song. So that's a Just do an off-chorus show. <laughs> oh, that'd be amazing. All choruses. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's just medleys of choruses. Um, but that's what we're learning. It's like, again, these shows are for the, for the people who pay to see us that we don't, it's not the self-indulgent. We do B sides, deep cuts only, bro. It's like, yeah, no, like, and that's the pitfall of a lot of tribute bands. They're playing songs they want to play, not the ones people want to hear. Um, so we've got about 60 songs that we do and they're fantastic. You know, some of the deeper ones that we play are always something there to remind me. I love that song and people still love it because they hear it in the grocery store. It still lives on. We still play Everybody Have Fun Tonight, Wang Chung, that always crushes. And those are kind of the more of the deep cut jams. But then, you know, I mean, obviously we play Like a Prayer and uh, and that song murders. You know, you play Living on a Prayer, it murders. But most of our stuff is that fun, just, you know, like uh, um, uh, holding out for a hero and, um, you know, separate ways. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the catalog is so massive, you, you could hardly go wrong. You know, for us, part of the our favorite part about it is, is having these band discussions where we're picking out the songs. What are the new ones? Cause you want to constantly rotate in songs in and out. Cause we are playing in the Southeast mainly. And if we're coming back two months later, they don't want to see the same jams. So we honor people's investment in us cause it's expensive to go out. We honor that investment by making sure that it's a different show, different video packages, different songs, different production. And it's our way of telling people that we, you know, we don't take you as a fan for granted and we're not just going to play the same songs over and over, which is the tough part if you're a Journey tribute band. Like if you're a Journey tribute, you know, I mean, how many songs to every, I mean, I know them all because I'm a massive Journey fan, but the average Journey, the average 80s fan knows six, eight songs, maybe, maybe 10, you know? No, you change it up. You do it Arnell style. You, you could... <laughs> <laughs> you don't, oh, you don't you just do Steve. membership. You do swap yeah. membership. That's the genius. You should manage. Just do it mid show. <laughs> Fire the singer mid show. <laughs> I want to. I want to thank you like so much for. I know I don't want to take all your time today, but I want to thank you so much for hanging out with me. I know you have an insane schedule, and but I, I really appreciate you hanging out with me here. Um, so for for all the listeners, uh, make sure to follow Rich, follow Fozzie. Follow Guardians of the Jukebox. Um, uh, like I said, I'll have uh, links in, in the, the show notes so everybody can know about it. And uh, man, it's been awesome. I, I really appreciate your time.
No, it's been my privilege. We've been friends for a while and we've we've talked about doing this. So this is really special for me. Um, and if anyone out there is interested in like just entry to what is Guardians of the Jukebox, we just released a video and our new single is Flash Dance, What a Feeling. So if you just go to YouTube, you can check out the What a Feeling video. Um, and really, that's the, if a chef, if you say, what is the chef's food like? This is the one bite. You know, this is your first bite to give you an idea of what the Guardians of the Jukebox is all about. And then you can do the rabbit hole because there's we have three or four videos and lots of stuff on Spotify and Apple Music if you want to go listen to other music. But that's the first kind of um, first note I think everyone can check out. And I think, again, it'll let you know whether this band is for you or it's not. It is going to be for you. But, you know, I'm saying I'm leaving you the out. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Thank you again. And, and thanks, everybody. I will be back again next week. We're the kings and queens of the arcade scene. Now we're Googling what does he mean? From VHS to VR machines, we're the retro cool.